So hello and welcome back to Books and Things. Today I'm going to be doing my December wrap up. I am actually drinking tea now. I had my lens earlier today, but my voice is still slightly slightly dubious. So today I'm just going to be taking you through all the books I read in December. I had a pretty productive reading month, I think, in that I read 14 things, but it sounds like a lot more than it was because quite a lot of them were quite short. But let's get straight into the books I read. So at the beginning of December I did finally finish Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. I had started reading this in November and read it through a lot of November and then I did manage to finish it in about the first week of December. I really really enjoyed Anna Karenina. I'm really interested in Russian history and culture both in like the 19th and the 20th century and um, I didn't get the chance to start study Russian history in university but when I was at school for my history A level it was basically exclusively Russian history. I really really enjoyed that, I'm fascinated by that time period in Russia and reading Anna Karenina was therefore really interesting for me as apart from just the fact that it's a really good interesting story. I found it much more readable than I was expecting as well, like because it's such a big chunky book, I mean it's 1100 pages or something like that, I was expecting it to be a slightly slow read but although obviously it took me a long time because it's big, the chapters are quite short and it's really readable and I actually got through it quite quickly considering how long it is. Overall I did really enjoy it and I'm definitely going to try to pick up something else by Tolstoy in the future. Possibly I'm going to leave it a while before I pick up War and Peace though because I hear that's quite a big one as well. So sticking with the classics, after I'd finished Anna Karenina I went on a little bit of a Dickens binge. Not like a massive Dickens binge, just like a, a brief quick Dickens binge and I reread Barnaby Rudge. I read it when I was about 15 and I just didn't remember anything from it but I started rereading this and of course I loved it because it's Dickens. I love Dickens. I always love Dickens. Dickens is just the best ever. I love his writing. It's just beautiful. Barnaby Rudge is one of Dickens's two historical novels. So the other one is A Tale of Two Cities which is set during the French Revolution and Barnaby Rudge is set in London and the surrounding area in the 1770s and the 1780s and it kind of focuses on the anti-Catholic riots that went on in the 1780s in London. Although it is named after one of the characters Barnaby Rudge, I would say that Barnaby Rudge is much more of a chorus novel. Like there are a lot of characters and they're all quite important and as important as each other. Like I wouldn't say Barnaby Rudge is really the central character. However Barnaby Rudge is a really interesting character to take as a title character and as a protagonist for a Victorian novel. Barnaby Rudge suffers from what today we would call severe learning difficulties. His understanding and his memory is very limited and he isn't completely aware of what's going on around him. This makes for Barnaby Rudge both an interesting novel and quite an uncomfortable one. Dickens does present Barnaby Rudge I think quite well but obviously the terminology used to describe people with learning difficulties in the 19th century is not necessarily very pleasant and is a bit uncomfortable reading now. However Barnaby Rudge is quite an interesting character. The very fact that Dickens chooses to take Barnaby Rudge as his title character is quite significant and his presentation is quite interesting. So in a lot of Victorian literature characters with mental or physical disabilities tend to be presented either as villains or victims. Those tend to be the two polarising things. If you think about in the old curiosity shop there is a character called Quilp who is the villain and he suffers from dwarfism and his evilness is bound up with his disability in a way that is to be honest not very pleasant and you find this in quite a lot of 19th century novels and then at the other end of the spectrum you have characters like Tiny Tim who is presented as a victim and as kind of morally pure because of his disability in quite an interesting way. The way that Victorians think about disability is both unsettling and really like fascinating from an academic perspective as well. Mental disability is something slightly different and not dealt with as much in Victorian literature and the way that Dickens deals with it in Barnaby Rudge is quite interesting because Barnaby Rudge basically falls in with the wrong crowd and ends up helping the rioters. So he kind of falls in with the villains because of his mental disability but then he's also sort of a victim because they kind of trick him into joining them. But at the same time he's something much more complicated th than that and Dickens kind of praises his like happiness and his faith in the world and it's just really interesting. In terms of Dickens overall work it's a very dramatic book like a lot of stuff happens there's a lot of violence and I think that might appeal to some people and that there's a lot more like drama and a lot more physical things going on in Barnaby Rudge. However for me because the central like tie in Barnaby Rudge is these riots these events rather than particular characters I find some of the characters are not drawn quite as interestingly as they might be. Barnaby Rudge is definitely not my favourite Dickens novel in general I much prefer Dickens later works to his earlier works or sort of the second half of his career from Dombey and Son onwards to his earlier stuff. This is partly to do with the way the kind of characterization changes and the sort of broader themes of his books that change over time and it's a lot to do with the presentation of women in his early books. So Barnaby Rudge is his fifth novel, it is in like the earlier half and 
like Martin Chuzzlewit, like the Pickwick Papers, it is a very, very male novel, like the majority of the characters are men and most of the female characters, even if they're central to the plot, they're not that interesting and they're not that kind of well developed. I'm sorry, I can go on f about this for a long time. I love Dickens and because he is my favourite author, I think I'm more critical of him sometimes. So like the female characters in Barnaby Rudge, Barnaby's mother could be a really fascinating character, but she kind of ends up being absent for a lot of the story when she could be much more interesting than she is. And then the two kind of younger heroines, one of them, Emma Haredale, could be a really interesting character and I can kind of see in her the kind of seeds of interesting kind of really moral strong women like Esther Summerson and Bleak House later on in Dickens's career but as it is in Barnaby Rudge she's kind of not fully developed. And then there's Dolly Varden and I really like the way she acts and her dialogue except every now and then Dickens stops to describe what Dolly Varden looks like and the language Dickens uses to describe this young woman Dolly Varden it's really really unsettling. He uses like half the language you would use to describe a really sexy woman and half the language you would use to describe a really cute child and it's just a bit creepy quite frankly Dickens is creepy and I love Dickens a great deal as I have said before but that did kind of jar me and annoy me anyway what am I talking about yes basically I loved Barnaby Rudge because I love Dickens writing style and I find it so thoroughly engaging and there are some brilliant characters in here like Hugh one of the villains is really interesting and one of the things he does really well in Barnaby Rudge is that the riots kind of change a lot of people so there's a lot of people who you see before the riots and you have this particular opinion of them before the riots and then when the riots occur that opinion kind of changes so there are characters who seem really funny and then later on become quite sinister or there are characters who you really don't like and then you kind of get to see a different side of them due in the riots and I think that is one thing about Barley Rudge that I really love but some of the presentation of women did just make me like oh Dickens Dickens because I know he can do better and he does better in his later novels and it annoys me in his early novels that the women are just pathetic and fate all the time it annoys me Dickens bad Dickens okay I'm done now this has been a long Barnaby Rudge rant and when I said I'm done I meant I'm done with Barnaby Rudge not Dickens because I also read this which is Dickens at Christmas and this is beautiful I mentioned this yesterday because I got it for Christmas and I just ah oh, Dickens this is great anyway I just this is wrap up is basically just gonna be like 10 minutes of Dickens and then like two minutes of everything else right so this is a really lovely collection of Dickens's Christmas novellas and a few other like Christmas short stories and stuff which I just thoroughly loved because Dickens it includes a Christmas carol which I had read before but it also includes several Christmas novellas that I had not read before which is very exciting so as well as a few short works it also has The Chimes, The Battle of Life, The Cricket on the Hearth and The Haunted Man. I really really loved The Cricket on the Hearth. For me The Cricket on the Hearth has that perfect Dickensian blend between like serious earnest emotion and what I'm gonna call Shakespearean silliness but which I mean like trickery and disguises and like weird reveals which I really enjoy in Shakespeare and I really enjoy in Dickens. And while on the subject of Christmas I also read The Children of Green No by Lucy Boston which was just lovely. I already spoke about this in my favourite literary Christmases. It's about a boy who goes to stay with his great grandmother over Christmas in this really old house and while there he kind of discovers that the house is haunted by the children that used to live there but it's kind of haunted in a really happy way like they're not sinister they're just kind of happy playing ghosts of children and it's just great uh, yeah I thought it was beautiful and lovely and really Christmassy. I also read City of Bones by Cassandra Clare which is the first of three in the Mortal Instruments trilogy and it's part of the broader Shadowhunter series. I read The Infernal Devices early on in the year which is a kind of a Victorian trilogy within the Shadowhunter series and I really loved that. I did like this, I didn't like it as much as The Infernal Devices but I wasn't expecting to. As with The Infernal Devices I found it really gripping and really engaging and really like got into the plot and liked all the characters um, and I did really like it the more I read it. I must admit that when I was reading the first half of the book I was a bit cautious that it was going to be really similar to the Infernal Devices but not as good but as it went on I didn't find that the case at all like in the second half of the book there were a lot of things that really surprised me. I was very surprised by several things which is always good especially in that kind of YA fantasy where sometimes things can be a bit predictable and I was so glad that they weren't. I also read All This Has Nothing To Do With Me by Monica Savalo. I think that's how you say her name I'm not certain. So I first heard about this book ages ago on Candice's channel that's Candy something I'll link her channel down below and then I also heard about it more recently on Jen Cam Campbell's channel. I have a feeling Jen Campbell didn't actually like it that much but I think because of the way Jen was talking about it even though she didn't love it I kind of knew that I might and I did really like it. Again I may think maybe a bit like Jen I was a little bit disappointed by a few things and possibly by the ending but overall I did really enjoy it. It's kind of a scrapbook 
of a woman's obsession with a man she works with I guess is the best way to describe it. There's a lot of like text messages between them, there's items she has collected from him, that kind of thing. There is pictures of motorbikes she sees around the city which she m thinks may or may not be his and just a lot of weird stuff like that along with some writing and I just really enjoyed that because it was just a nice new unique way of telling a story. I also read some non-fiction I read Weird Things Customers Say in Bookshops which was put together by Jen Campbell like, who I just spoke about again I'll link her channel down below. I'd read bits of this before but I've never actually read it. As I've been working for a bookshop in the last few months I thought it was about time I've read this all the way through. At Foils I was working in web orders not like on the shop floor so I didn't necessarily like get as many weird comments as people who work on the shop floor do but still some people said some odd things to me. This was both really funny and kind of heartbreaking. Look, someone went into a bookshop and asked did Charles Dickens ever write anything fun? This really makes me so sad. Everything Dickens wrote was fun. I also read a children's pitch book and that was The Fox and the Star. You've probably seen this going around on booktube and in the world. It was the Waterstones book of the year. So it's designed, illustrated and written by Coralie Bickford Smith who is the person who designs the covers of Penguin classics like the really nice cloth bound ones that look a bit like this. And I thought the story was lovely and I just thought, I mean look at it, it's just so utterly gorgeous. It's beautiful. I mean I really think this is one of the most beautiful books I've ever owned. It is so pretty and the story is lovely and I just couldn't resist. I also read two short story anthologies. Both of these I mentioned in my writing update like last week so I will link that down below because I had a story published in both of these but I'm not going to speak about my stories here. I'm just going to speak about like all the other stories I read. So the first one is this More Nuggets from Gold Dust. I really enjoyed this. As I said before I quite like Gold Dust magazine and not only because they published me before and it was really nice to read all the other stories in here. Some of which I'd read in previous editions and a lot of which I hadn't they were much older. There were some brilliant stories in here, there were some ones that were heart moving and a lot that were very unsettling and I quite like the way Gold Dust publishes stuff that is odd to the point that you're like what? Wait what just happened? In a really like unnerving way that gives you shivers, it was just great. There is also this which is Electric Reads Young Writers Anthology. As I said before I'm so excited to have a story in this because it feels really official, it has an Amazon and Goodreads page. Anyway that's beside the point. I really enjoyed reading all the other people's stories in here because it's so diverse, like it has a real mix of um, like fantasy and realism and magic realism. I had a few particular favourites, one of them was Where the Forgotten Things Go by Beth Gadsby. It was kind of a fantasy science fiction piece about creatures that move through time and age through space rather than the other way around and I just don't know how she managed to create like so impressive and so complete a world in like such a short story. I thought it was brilliant. I also really loved Isla by Harriet Avery which was a weird magic realism thing that was just odd and great and I loved it. And I also really loved Mona Lisa by Fiona McCormack who also has a booktube channel as I discovered so I will link her channel down below if you want to go and watch her videos because I'm really enjoying them. And now onto the poetry. I think I had like quite a varied month in my reading. Normally it's just like a lot of novels and maybe one short story collection whereas this month there has been a bit of everything. So first I read this which is a literary magazine called Rialto. I read this because after I spoke about some literary magazines I think last month Victoria from Hermit's Progress, again I'll link her channel down below, mentioned that this is one of the ones she really liked so I thought I would give it a try. I did really enjoy this, it's always great to read some poetry. I'm not sure I will subscribe to it but I think it's the kind of one that I will buy every now and then but I think because in general I like prose more than poetry and I think I prefer literary magazines that have both prose and poetry because of that but I did still really enjoy it and there were some brilliant poems in here. So the final three things I read in December were these three poetry pamphlets. These are all published by a small independent publisher called Emma Press who I've discovered this month and I've fallen in love with. I adore them. I mean look they're so beautiful. Look look. So Rivers Wanted and The Flower and The Plough are by Rachel Piercy. I really enjoy both of these. I think I preferred this one so this is like a collection of her love poetry and this is kind of not love it's about kind of other stuff a bit of a mix of things and I really loved this. I really loved Tea with Eva and The Boys Who Take Traffic Cones because I thought both of them were just really interesting and a bit different. And finally The Emery's by Richard Bryan also from the Emma Press. I actually read this one before the Rachel Piercy ones and I bought the Rachel Piercy ones because I'd read this and loved it so much so I want to talk about this last. This was one of my favourite reads of the month and the year. I just thought it was incredibly beautiful. I cried. I can't remember the last time I cried at a poem. I think the only other poem I've ever cried at is Long Distance 2 by Toni Harrison which alongside At Castle Botterell by Thomas Hardy is my favourite poem of all time. I was so utterly moved by this and it surprised me because it's love poetry and normally, I, I don't want to say I'm unromantic but I'm a bit unromantic, I normally don't like love poetry that much, it's normally not always my thing. Whereas this was just gorgeous, I can't explain why but it just 
really moved me. It was beautiful. I'm going to read you the last poems and then I will leave you because this wrap up has probably been incredibly long and I blame the Dickens rant early on. Okay. Le Man. Lover, slumberjack, roll over in your clown pyjamas. Wonder if it's really all from here true comfort comes. From ticket stubs and hotel breakfast deals and cooking meals together. Chop for you and save what's left the way you ask me to. And stock the fridge for you with juice, lemon parfait, two kinds of cheese with unfamiliar names, salmon for bagels, share a single plate. The little rituals I assimilate, like washing rice, wearing more red and sleeping on just one side of the bed. Though sometimes your first night away, on yours. So find me in the kitchen where I'll kiss your neck and whisper in your ear how I like the way you dislike things more than I like the way most people like the things they like and feel like this could be the future, leaning lightly on your shoulder, cracking jokes about your thermal stocking legs. I can't believe the way you poach those eggs. I don't know, it was just really nice to have a love poem that wasn't like dramatic, was just about like cooking together. It was really cute and moving and like the kind of quiet, nice domesticity of love. It was beautiful. Okay, I'm done now. So I hope you have enjoyed my December wrap up. Please let me know if you have read any of these books and what you've thought of them. And please let me know what your favorite book of December was. I'll be back tomorrow with another video because it's one of those weeks. And anyway, see you soon. Happy reading.